morning, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Let's just begin to thank the Lord as we enter into his presence this morning. Thank you, Lord. We bless your mighty name, Jesus. God, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for who you are, Lord. God, we thank you for what you've done in our personal lives, Jesus. God, we thank you for what you've done in our families. God, we thank you for what you've done in our workplaces. Just begin to thank him in your own words for your own things, God. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your kindness, God. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your grace that empowers. Thank you, God. I just want to read to you a portion of Isaiah 61. In Isaiah 61, the very beginning is what Jesus quoted when he stood up in the synagogue and it was his turn to read, where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. But I want to skip down to verse 3. To grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall rebuild up, they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And what we see is that God is saying, this is what I've come to do. And so Lord, this morning, God, we rest in your goodness. Lord, we let all other things fall away and we choose to focus on you. God, it's just like you to give beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, praise for heaviness. Jesus, you said, all who are weary, come to me and I will give you rest. So, Lord, we lean into that this morning. We lean into what's already been made available to us. Praise for heaviness, 
every good thing it's all from you and it's all for you i give my all for you it's all from you and it's all for you oh take us out of our contentment lord we want more we want more it's all from you and it's all for you it's all from you and it's all for you it's all for you
crashing like the rain. Apart from your goodness, God, you are glorious, you are holy, holy, the heaven shall, you are worthy, worthy. no hope for you have broken the chains now joy it fills my life your spirit your life I'm undone by the kindness of Christ you are glorious you are holy holy the heaven shout that you are worthy, worthy. My soul cries out that you are holy, you're holy. The nations will shout you are worthy. to God right now 
and we're going to fix our eyes on him and we're going to praise him and we're going to believe that as we worship, he's going to heal our bodies. He's going to heal our hearts. And at the sound of our praise, the heavens will shake and the earth will move. And at the sound of our praise, the heavens will shake and the earth will move. And at the sound of our praise, the heavens will shake and the earth will move. And at the sound of our praise, the heavens will shake Come on, praise Him. Give Him all the praise. The sound of our praise, the heavens will shake and the earth will move. At the sound of our praise, the heavens will shake. Let him hear your prayer. At the sound of our praise, the heavens will shake and the earth will move. At the sound of our praise, the heavens will shake and the earth will move. Cause you are glorious, you are holy, holy, the heavens shout that you are worthy, worthy. The soul cries out that you are holy, you're holy. The nations will shout that you are worthy, worthy.
it's our joy to praise your name give him all the praise Lord. Joy. it's our joy it's our joy it's our joy It's our joy, it's our joy, it's our joy to lay down. It's our joy, it's our joy, it's our joy to praise now. It's our joy, it's our joy, it's our joy to lay down. It's our joy, it's our joy, it's our joy to praise now. It's our joy, it's our joy, it's our joy to lay it down. It's our joy, it's our joy, it's our joy to praise now. Take pleasure in your presence, pleasure in your presence, Lord. Just want you. Oh, we just want you. by you. 
this morning we say make our hearts pure that we would see you and that we would see you rightly King Jesus Lord we're so thankful that it's not based on what we've done and who we are but it's based on who you are and what you've done for us it's not something we could earn or deserve it's not something we have to be worthy of to receive. Your blood has made us able to receive. Your blood washes over us. Your blood covers us, Jesus. we thank you this morning God let's just give the Lord the highest praise let's just express him express to him his greatness Lord you are worthy God you're the worthy one we thank you Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world the one the only one who was worthy to open the scroll we thank you just keep praising him Thank you, God. With your own words, just keep praising him. God, thank you for your blood. Thank you for forgiveness. Jesus, we give you praise. We thank you, God. Lord, it's at your name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We thank you, Lord, that you are making your enemies a footstool for your feet, God. We thank you, God. Lord, that you are at work in our lives. We thank you for wholeness 
in Jesus. We thank you for healing, God. We thank you for freedom, God. We thank you, God, that you have taken our shame and our guilt. Lord, we thank you that we could be free in you. Lord, this morning we give you praise. Lord, there's no one like you in all the earth. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We bless your name today, Lord Jesus. It's just a, such a sweet name, the name of Jesus. It's like honey on our lips. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We exalt your name today, God. We thank you, God, for the privilege of being able to praise and worship you, to exalt you, Lord. And you say, God, Lord, where we are, two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. So as we praise you, you manifest your presence here, right here. And we thank you for being here with us today. God, I ask that you move in every heart and every life. Draw people closer to you. Let Jesus' name be exalted in this place. Touch bodies and minds. Lord, heal wounds. Be near to those who are brokenhearted. Bind them up, God. And we give you praise right now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Bless you guys. Good morning. And welcome to Faith Chapel. We're going to take a couple moments and uh, transition to the next portion of our service. So uh, while we're doing that, we just encourage you to take a, take a minute or two and say hi to people around you. Introduce yourself. Um, bless you guys. Good morning, wonderful Faith Chapel family. So great to be with you all. If you could make it to, back to your seats, continue with our service. It's so beautiful to hear everyone just talking among each other and just loving on each other. It's just such a wonderful thing, isn't it? Friendship is wonderful, and it's of the Lord, right? Praise the Lord. Well, I just want to welcome you all here. I'm excited that we get to uh, um, worship the Lord together. Wasn't worship amazing? Thank you, worship team. That was so good, so powerful. And that we can uh, continue in worship um, as we're together, as we fellowship, as we hear the word, as we worship together in prayer. It's a lovely thing. I want to welcome our live stream friends as well. We're so glad that you've joined us today. 
And um, we pray that the Lord would meet you as well in a very special way. And so um, here at Faith Chapel, our mission and our mandate is to um, raise up disciples that would impact their world. And we want to see you all be um, built up and discipled and powerful men and women of God that when you go out in your normal life, you don't feel you, you, you are so ready to take a risk to see God move in your life and to see him glorified, to see people saved in your life, to see people healed and delivered right in your sphere of influence. Come on, isn't that amazing? Like that's what he's called us to do. And so we want to see you guys go farther and deeper in the things of God than we will. And so we want um, you to stand on our shoulders to be powerful for God. So that's our mission and I did that in a very long thing, so sorry about that. Um, as you notice, if you are in the front seat, it would be in the backs, back of you. But for those who are the rest of you, um, in front of you, there is a card. It's called the Connection Card. And that card helps us to connect with you, to um, receive any prayer requests or praise reports um, that the Lord is doing. And also um, to let us know who came with you. Um, and you can sign up for things as well. And so if you would take a moment to fill that out, you can also fill it out electronically on our mobile app. And um, as the ushers come by with the offering, you can place that connection card in there or in the black box at the back um, of our sanctuary. So that would be such a blessing for us. And some of you have new phone numbers, right? Some of you may have new addresses. Make sure you place that on there. Write that on there so that we can connect with you. And if you are, as if, if this is your first time here, if this is your, if you're a new guest, we are so excited that you're here. And I just want to say, no worries. Okay, just let the Lord touch you. Make yourself at home. No worries about anything. Just, just um, let the Lord touch you today. And we also have um, a booth as you were walking in. Um, that's our welcome center. You can stop by there. There's a gift for you. Um, there's a friendly face. Our beautiful Joan Russell is there, and she'll answer any questions you may have, so you don't want to miss that. Um, let's see here. So we have a few announcements to share. Um, we have a transformation workday coming up, Transformation House Workday, and I'm excited about it. For those who don't know, the Transformation House is a home we we bought, and we are renovating it so that we can be, have a greater presence on the south side of Syracuse to uh, see God move and to be a light there in that neighborhood. And so um, we would love for you to join us. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter your skill level. Just come. I'm so excited that there's no discrepancy in my schedule. I'm going to be there. <laughs> Even if I have to peel wallpaper off the wall. Come on. I'm going to be there on uh, February 3rd, so you don't want to miss that. And um, right now, I'm just going to um, invite our wonderful ushers to come forward, and um, we are going to um, receive the offering this morning. And it is such a joy to be able to give back to God, not only our time, our talent, but also our finances. You know, he owns everything. And for me, I know it's such a value to me because the Bible tells us to do it. You know, he tells us all throughout his word about giving to him first. And so I have it on automatic. It automatically comes out of my account when I get paid the 10% in the offering. And I have been so blessed, and I know you will be as well if, if, you, continue, if you take that step of faith to give. How many in here can say amen to that, amen, who've experienced the Lord's blessing? So I'm going to pray over the offering, and, and then I'll invite our connect group leaders to come forward. <laughs> so Father, I just thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity, 
Lord, uh, for us to be together today on this beautiful day in January. And I pray, Father, Lord, that as people give, that you would bless them, God, that you would bless them financially, emotionally, spiritually, Lord, that you would move so powerfully, God, in their lives, God. And I pray that their money that they give would be used to glorify you, God, that it would do exceedingly abundantly above all that they could ask or imagine. And as us as a church, as well, that every dime used, Lord, would be used to glorify you, God, and to advance your kingdom. We ask that you would multiply it and bless it. Bless the giver and bless the gift, and we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So right now, I'm just going to invite all of our um, connect group leaders to come forward and stand right across the front here. And as you are coming in, you probably saw a table there on the left hand side and that has all of our groups that we have this semester and groups are so important to us here at Faith Chapel because we do not have a midweek service and so this is our way that we connect with each other and we grow and God does amazing amazing things I was thinking about it earlier that there is um, statistics that I have that I don't have in front of me of what God did last year in last semester, or actually last year in the groups, and there was many who were saved, there was many who were healed, there was many who were emotionally healed and delivered in our groups, amen? And so he's still doing it. So I'm going to go down the line, and I will start right over here with Naomi. Okay, um, what is the name of your group, and um, when do you guys meet in a 20-minute testimony <laughs> of what it's about. Um, so I have two... 20, 20 second. <laughs> say, how much minutes are you giving me? Wait a minute. Uh, so I have two small groups. The first one is Friday evenings. Um, they both start at 5.30 to 6.30 roughly. And it's Friday and Saturday. Friday is creative worship. So if you like to sew, if you want to help us make new flags and make more flags, or if you want to start um, working on, like, flag worshiping and uh, dancing, if that's anything that you're interested in, um, we will be allowing, I will allow children to be there. Just you have to be supervised. So if you want to bring your, your grandchild, your child, or somebody that, wants, that likes to dance and stuff, you can bring them. Uh, Saturday is women's, so that's just a women's small group, same time in the prayer room until we fill the prayer room. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so I jumped in the front of the line because these are all connect group leaders, and all the connect group leaders have gone through either the growth track or the school of ministry, and so because our, our church is heavily focused on discipleship, we always encourage people, if you haven't um, gone through the growth track, that's the first thing that you should do. Now, I can't make you do that, but our goal is to make available to you the discipleship process. So it's called the growth track. Um, at our home, my wife Kelly and mine, we have, um, we have growth track level three, so you would go through one and based upon the semester, you're either going into three or going into two. It's not sequential. You just have to go through one first. Our group meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Sister Portia. Um, I facilitate the Back to Basics group. Um, it's a, a basic group about building up your faith and about a foundational understanding about the Word of God. It is for new believers and for old believers. How many of us know we're still learning things in the things of God? Yep, growth track level one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we meet on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, and that should be starting at the end of February. Yay. Um, yes, my group is Tuesdays at my house in Fairmount, and it's, uh, we have a light supper first because eating's always fun. <laughs> and we have a time of fellowship and a meal together. And then we go on to either um, a video or we use this book called Liberated by Rodney Hogue. 
a very good book that Pastor Kelly had recommended. And we're all searching and seeking and developing greater freedom in Christ. And we're all at different levels in different places in our journey, but boy, we have a lot to learn from each other as we share in honesty and truth. Thank you, Mary Martha. Okay. Yes, I'm Dorothy Tilden, and we meet here on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we've been doing it for almost 10 years. So we have a wonderful group, and we're always trying to go forward and mature in the Lord, and the book that we're doing now is called Where Do We Go From Here? And that is uh, teaching us and showing how to live in the difficult world that we're living in today. Okay, and yours is a women's Bible study. It's a women's Bible study. Yes, okay. it is. So good morning. Uh, my name is Frederica Hubert. I'm filling in for Perry and Nikki. They are on assignment today. Uh, my husband David is on assignment out in the foyer. So we have a couples group meets every um, Sunday, um, the last Sunday of the month, right after church. We have also lunch. And the focus is really on the couples. Um, in one piece, I want to just share um, that it's we are as a three chord, and a three chord cannot be easily broken. And I want to encourage everybody um, out of my personal experience in life, it is much easier to live life uh, when you have others supporting you, when you go to good times and difficult times. And I want to just encourage you to come and just have a good time as couples and really with the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Morning. So our group meets Wednesday nights at 6.30 at our home. Michelle normally cooks. Um, <laughs> this time around we're doing um, Bradger, Zach's Can You Hear Me? Um, so Kingdom Sons and Daughters may ask questions as what they need answers to, but they don't typically hear, even though God is speaking. So it's just a book about how we can hear and like the different ways that God speaks to us. Amen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ron Monerville. Um, uh, I have a group that I'm uh, uh, putting together for golfers. I'm trying to bring Jesus to the golf course. And, and we, have, uh, we have three rules to play the golf. You have to love Jesus or you want to find Jesus, and you have to be able to count to ten. Uh, if, 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 for, if for some reason you have an issue with that, you can talk to Eric Anderson. He's doing a remedial math class. And uh, <laughs> In any event, we're... Uh, we're, uh, our group is a anybody can come. It doesn't matter how you know good or bad you are, even if you've never played. Uh, it's a good group of guys. Uh, we have fun. Uh, we talk about the Lord. Um, and during the off season, we've uh, we decided to keep the group together, and so we're uh, going through um, the Gospels, and we're meeting here at eight thirty on Wednesday mornings. That's another great group of guys. We've had. Uh, uh, we've had some pretty uh, great discussions. And even, everyone's welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori Tyler. And uh, on Thursday night, we have an uh, intercessory group. And um, in the past, we have gone through a couple books, and we've, we've learned how to listen to God's voice. That is the focus of it, is hearing what God's saying and letting God pray through us on Thursday night. We... We cover many topics, uh, you know, from our world to our city, to our church, to individuals, and however the spirit is leading that night. We also have a group on Monday morning. Uh, we call it drive-by prayer. We go down into the city. If we can have drive-by shooters, we can have drive-by prayers. And uh, we do the same thing there. We listen to the Holy Spirit. We pray as he leads. And uh you know, both groups, the power of God comes down, and you just sit in the presence and just pray. It's awesome. It's so good. I'm Vince Aquilino. I don't remember the name of my group. Sorry, don't laugh. <laughs> I was golfing one day, and I asked the Lord, Lord, do you ever golf? You know what he said? Yes, I have. You never know what you might meet with Ron's group. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, uh, you know, Jesus gave us everything we need to overcome. He gave us his blood. He gave us his name. He took fear from us. But he's also given us weapons of our warfare. Jesus knew how to use the sword of the Spirit when he was confronted by the enemy in his wilderness experience. We need to also. But there are many other weapons he's provided for us that we can prosper and defeat that roaring lion who wants to devour us. 
He doesn't have a chance if we know what to do. So if that's what the class is about, you'll learn what to do. And when is that? Oh, I think it's Tuesdays. <laughs> Tuesdays at 6, we're going to do it on Zoom, so you don't have to worry about the weather. Hi, I'm Joe Blaze. Uh, we have a men's discipleship. We meet on, it, a little flexible, but usually at least once a month on Monday nights. And in between, we keep in touch. And we have a group. Uh, we have uh, a group of men each of us takes, and we call them, try to connect with them. Um, we could use more help. It's And it's very casual. It's very, hey, how you doing? You need any prayer requests? If you get any calls, that's that's us. And we just care about you, and we're, tr we're trying to connect. Um, I mean, Ron kind of started the golf group it's kind of like that it starts like that and it's just casual fellowship and then um we need relation and i think in the church we do the best we can on sundays and during the week but um we need more so we're trying to uh further relationships together and uh so come join us Hi, I'm Kevin. This is my wife, Chris. We we have a connect group. It's called the Worship Project. It happens every Thursday night at 6 p.m. at our place of business in Lafayette, New York, on Route 11. And our goal and our mission is to encourage through worship, through uh, prayer and testimony. And uh, we've seen people get set free from uh, oppression, depression, and uh, there's been healings, physical healings. So... We want to encourage the body, just to, it's another avenue of encouragement, and, uh, and we love the Lord, and we love to praise God, so praise Jesus. I just want to say also, um, we know that God has put treasure in each one of you. You have gifts, you have talents, you have an investment that God has made into you, and some of us don't know our spiritual gifts yet, but if you do, and you want to put them to use, Come to our place because we want to mine out of you what God has put in there and let you use and develop your, your gifts for his glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name's Amy. I'm standing in for Tony Manto. He has a Bible study on Friday at 7 o'clock for end times. It's half the time it's at his house. The other half it's at my house. But it's like a 2,000-calorie Bible study. <laughs> Because they love their snacks. And plus, he also has a Bible study, a men's Bible study, on Wednesday here at the church. And um, it's supposed to be men's only, but when I come to pick up my grandchildren um, for their riot group, I go and invade it. <laughs> That's my dad, by the way. Hi. Uh, my name is Kevin uh, Lee. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's Psalm 91, and that's what our, our group is about. We read from his book. It's the military edition of Psalm 91. It has um, testimonies in it, definitely a study of the Psalm 91 uh, promise, a uh, covenant of protection that God puts over for us and our families. So we meet every Tuesday and no, Tuesday, or the fourth and the second Tuesdays of the month at 530 in the atrium. And we have a few guys, we just talk about it and we study it, how God protects us and watches over. This is the first um, scripture I memorized or pretty much God gave to my heart uh, when I came to the Lord. I was really tormented, scared, um, and God gave me this, um, this song to memorize. And it's my covenant of protection. And it's not mine. More people I talk to mention it. They, they talk about how They've, they read it every day, they memorize it, and it's really good testimonies how God protects us, us and our families. And so we meet, as I said, the second and the fourth Thursdays, 5.30 in the atrium. Yes. All right. God bless you. Uh, so my name is Michael Barfnick, and I lead this group with my wife, Natalie, who is home with our daughter right now. Um, so if you are a person here that has been coming and you're feeling a little disconnected or like you really want 
some Christian friends. This is kind of why we started this group. Our group is called The Chosen. We watch the, the TV show The Chosen. We community with each other. We fellowship with each other for 6.30 to 7. We worship for until the Lord tells us to stop. And then we watch an episode, and then we begin to just talk about it and connect and see what's going on with each other's lives. And, and then we've had... <laughs> We've had the spirit fell quite a lot, um, and it, it's been truly an awesome privilege to be part of this group and minister with these people and just get in each other's lives. And I know from my heart, I feel like some of us have, like my, our family has gained just a huge community because of this group, which is what small groups are supposed to be. We're supposed to be a place where we get to know each other and get into each other's lives. And uh, so, yeah, if you're uh, feeling a little disconnected and need some Christian friends, chosen. Oh, yeah, Friday. Friday at 6.30. Yeah. Okay, that awesome. <laughs> and then I lead a group uh, with D. Can you wave, D? Yeah. And Lori. Lori. And um, we lead a group for young women, um, and we call it Moms and Millennials. And it's a group just for um, us to connect um, as women with the younger women to make space for them, to give them room to be able to um, have a safe place to uh, share, and we share, and it's so good. And so we meet just once a month on the second Sunday um, at the Blazes House. So if you are a young woman and you would like to connect, we would love to have you. And Chris is going to be sharing for the next few times, so it's going to be so good. Awesome. So thank you, Connect Group leaders. I just want to thank you for your time and your service to the body. And may God move so powerfully in your groups, in you and through you, and that Faith Chapel will never be the same again. Amen? All right. Bless you guys. Amen. Amen. All right. Are you ready for the word today? Okay. I am going to invite... Brother Jeff Masella up. Would you welcome him to the stage as he shares the word? Thank you, Pastor Jim. Thank you, church, and those online. I, this is an honor to be able to uh, teach you this morning. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I do have a, uh, a message on my heart. We're going to just focus right now on Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 6. And um, I want to give you a little bit of background of the book of Romans. The book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the, in the city of Rome. And it was, uh, he wrote this around 56 AD during his third missionary journey. And the church of Rome was, based, was made up of Jews and Gentiles alike. All right? So this was, a, 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 like I said, a letter, a church letter written to uh, the book of Romans, and it really is lathered with and laced with a lot of the Christian doctrine that we live by, all right? Now, we as Christians believe that as Paul and other authors of the scriptures wrote the scriptures, that they were divinely anointed by the Holy Spirit, and there is no error there. It's inerrant because it comes from God, though he did write through the man. And so we're picking up in Romans chapter 6, and just at the end of chapter 5, Paul, again, is talking about uh, the difference between Adam and Christ. This is almost a part two of what I taught back in early December. And what he's talking about is how we're all born in sin because of Adam, but because of Christ's death and resurrection, we now have eternal life. We now have uh, the power within us by the Holy Spirit to live not as sinful creatures like we used to live when we were unbelievers, but as the righteousness of God in Christ now that we are believers. And so Paul is talking about grace. He's telling us that we're saved by grace, which is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God giving us something that, er, and causing us to do or be something that we could not do or be on our own. That's what grace is. It's an empowerment. Grace is not God winking at sin. Grace is not excusing sin. And we're going to see how Paul addresses this very clearly. Grace is God's empowerment, enablement for us as believers to live according to what God requires of his people, which is a holy life. 
And uh, so we're starting in chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And as you can see, there is a, I almost forgot about this, but I, I looked online and we are, as I said before, we are a three-part being. We have a spirit. We also, so the spirit is our eternal being. This is, the per, this is the part of our being that lives forever. All right, so those of us who receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord, that spirit lives in heaven forever. People who've rejected Christ and did not receive the salvation through Jesus, the scriptures are clear that they spend eternal damnation in hell for eternity. So the spirit is either born again or it's not. But we, then we have a soul, which is kind of our psyche. All right, it's our belief system. It's the way we interact with people. It's, it's how we uh, kind of process life. That is our psyche. And then, of course, our body right here is our physical connection with the world. This is how we connect with people. This is how we connect with life. This is how we connect with um, money, finances, our jobs, whatever. This is how we speak, all right? And so the body is actually, for those who are believers, are God's interaction or God's, we are God's conduit to this earth. And so in Romans chapter 6, Paul is talking about the born-again spirit, okay, the person that lives forever. So keep that in mind. And he's saying to us that now that you're born again, now that you're saved, in your spirit, you've been regenerated. You are born again. You have the kingdom of God within you. You have the light and the life. Now, where the problem with sin is, it's in the soul and in the body. That's why the Bible tells us to renew our minds to the word. What we're doing is we're, we're renewing our soul. Because once we start to think like the word of God, we're going to start to act like the word of God. So it starts in the spirit. We become born again instantaneously when we come to Christ as the Holy Spirit reveals his messiahship to us. And we receive Christ. We are instantaneously born again. The Holy Spirit comes into our spirits, takes out the old man, puts in the new man, However, we still have the old soul and the old body. And so we have to renew our minds to the word so eventually our body reflects what happens in our spirit. The true goal, the ultimate goal for the Christian is to get all three of these in line together. Get our spirit, our body, I mean, and our soul to line up with our born again, our born again spirit, to line up with that third person of who we are. So when the spirit and the soul and, and body are at sync, we're obeying God and we're living for him, it is powerful. It is awesome. God is glorified through us, and he also can use us in a mighty way. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. This is a process. It is a journey. We will never reach perfection down here on earth. But the Bible tells us to strive for perfection. So don't get discouraged if you're sitting there this morning and you're saying, well, my spirit or my soul and my body is not lining up with the word. Well, after today's message, you're going to see that God has graced us and empowered us to do this. So let's start with Romans chapter 6, and we're just going to camp out in Romans 6 right here. It's a very powerful scripture. It's probably one of my favorite. And the, re the reality of this chapter was revealed to me back in 1991, and it set me free from a lot of things. And it's, I'm very passionate about this. So Paul starts out in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What he says is, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So in chapter 5, Paul was talking about grace. By God's grace, we are born again. By God's grace, we are saved. By God's grace, we are free from sin. And what Paul is saying is here, wait a minute, guys. Do we say that we can do whatever we want? We can still live however we want because of grace? And then he says in, in verse 2, he says with explanation marks, certainly not. Absolutely not. Get that out of your mind. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death? Verse 4, therefore, we were buried with him, which, which is Jesus, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. 
verse 5. For if we have been united together in this likeness of Jesus' death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So I want to tell you something here. When an individual comes to Jesus, when, they're, when it's revealed to them that they need a Messiah and Jesus is it, and they cry out to Jesus and they say, I receive your salvation, I want you to be my Savior, the Holy Spirit baptizes the spirit man, the part of the spirit, the three, remember, we're three-part being, the Holy Spirit baptizes our spirit into the spiritual death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we say yes to Jesus from the heart, instantaneously the Holy Spirit's taking our spirit, baptizing it in Jesus' death, raising it up into the resurrection, and now we walk in this newness of life. At that time, God no longer deems us or labels us as sinners. We are not sinners saved by grace anymore. We're not sinners. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We might have a problem with sin in the soul realm and in the body realm. This is what this is all about. This is what this is addressing. Paul says, yeah, I get it. You have a problem with sin, but guess what? You don't have to live like that anymore because of what the Holy Spirit did in your spirit. Born again. Now, water baptism is very important because I believe in water baptism, there's a special grace that comes on by the Holy Spirit that enables us to live this out. But water baptism is an outward sign of what the Holy Spirit did with us inwardly when we came to Christ. So that's what the Bible says here when it says, we were buried with Christ through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, just like that, we should walk in the newness of life. We need to start getting a picture of our born-again spirits as righteous as Jesus was when he raised from the dead before he ascended to Christ. Because that's the way God sees us. But see, what happens is, I get dry mouth very easily. That's why I keep doing this. Sorry. What happens is, because we struggle with sin in the soul and in the body, Satan makes us think we're sinners. And he's like, well, this is very far-fetched because you still have issues. But the Paul is addressing this. And he's saying, well, first of all, grace is not a wink at sin. God is not saying, well, you know, my grace now will cover it. Because some people, some Christians over history would believe that. That when we become saved, because of God's grace, we can live whatever we want. That is the biggest deception to the devil. How can we glorify Christ if we live the way we want? If we live in sin, we can't, right? So verse 6, where it says, Knowing this, that our old man, our old sinful nature, our old sinful spirit. Remember what I said earlier. We are... Individuals, all humanity, all across the globe, fall into two cat one of two categories. Either they're born again, and their spirit is righteous, or their spirit is damned. Two of them. There's no third option. There's no three and a half options. You're either in the kingdom of God or you're not. Now, we can all be in the kingdom of God. God, Jesus has died and resurrected for all of us. So what he's saying is, your old man, when you came to Christ, your spirit is now born again. That was your old man. He is buried and dead where Christ, when he died. And now you're resurrected into this new life. So the body of sin, verse 6 tells us in Romans, Romans 6, 6, so the body of sin might be done away with, that we, as born-again believers, should not anymore be a slave to sin. So the Lord has, really, has delivered us from the slavery of sin and the slavery of flesh. We are no longer slaves of sin. About a year and a half after, uh, about a year and a half, well, the Lord gave me this revelation a year and a half after my grandfather, my maternal grandfather passed away. Now, he was a godly man. He lived for the Lord. I was very close with both of my maternal grandparents. 
Uh, my, my paternal grandparents, they died when I was almost six. I remember them very little, but because they died when I was so young, I didn't have a relationship with them. They were godly as well. I was blessed to have godliness from both sides of my family. People who serve the Lord on both sides of my family heard God's voice and followed him no matter what. I was blessed. So my, when my grandfather Corenti died in 1989, it impacted me. Because at that time, I was young enough, and he was uh, actually, to this point almost, he was the closest person to me that died even up to this day. And so, <clears throat> as the Lord revealed this to me about a year and a half after he died, he said to me, it is unnat is it, 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 as unnatural it would be, Jeff, for you to go to your grandfather's grave and dig up his body, is as unnatural as that is, it's unnatural for Christians to sin because of what I've done in the spirit. And when, he, when he, he, he gave me that contrast, I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, if I were to go to my grandfather's grave and dig it up, I would get arrested. I mean, I mean that's not anything, you, you know, you don't get away with this. This is, this is barbaric, right? Unusual. And so what God was saying is it's unusual because of what I've done in the born-again spirit, it's unusual for Christians to sin. Now again, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. We all have problems with sin, don't we? I do. I'll raise two hands. All right? But the Lord has given us, through, his, through the born again experience, a way out of that. A way out of that quagmire. He doesn't see us as sins anymore. And we have to let this burn in our minds consistently and see that our bodies, our spirits are the righteousness of God in Christ. Just as Jesus was glowing with righteousness, with holiness, even though he never, he never sinned, he never had sin, but just as powerful and glorious as his resurrection is, our spirits are. And we have to start seeing that. When we want to sin, we have to start seeing that image in our minds. Verse 7, For he who has died has been freed from sin. In other words, it doesn't mean physical death. It means when we came to Christ, our, our sinful spirit was crucified. It was cut off with, when Jesus died and resurrected. The same thing. And so what, it, what, it's, what Paul is saying in verse 7, for, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. So it does, see, there's two parts here. There's a death and there's a resurrection. When Jesus died, he died, then he was resurrected. He died, then he was resurrected. If he just died, there's no salvation, right? If he just, he couldn't just resurrect without a death. When we come to Christ, there's a death and there's a resurrection. There's not just a death, there's a resurrection. God just doesn't kill sin in our lives. He gives us something better. God just doesn't remove the bad. He gives us something good. And so that's what this is saying. Now that we believe that we've died with Christ, guess what? We need to live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been died to sin, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. In verse 11, Paul is saying, Likewise, just like Christ, you born-again believer in Jesus. Now, you know, he is talking to the Roman church here. He is writing to the Roman church, but it's for all believers. The, the epistles in the New Testament are always written to specific churches or specific people or maybe a, a specific pastor, but it's written, maybe it's written for the whole body of Christ for generations to come until Jesus comes back. So this letter is for us. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us through us. So he's saying in verse 11, just like what Jesus died and resurrected, you reckon yourself to be dead in sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, I mean, he's hammering this. Because of that, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, because you have been made in the newness of Christ, because your spirit your sinful spirit has been crucified, and now you have a new spirit resurrected. Verse 12 is saying, therefore, or because, Christian, 
Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. You notice how we have the choice? God doesn't come down and automatically cause us to live this way. It's our choice. He gives us the enablement. He gives us the power. But it's our choice. Okay? We have the choice. And as I said earlier or before, there's consequences to our choices. So we want to always make sure we make the godly choice. Verse 13, and do not present yourself as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members of instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not, if you do this, sin will not have dominion over you for you are not under law anymore, but you are now under grace. The law, the job of the law was this, the Ten Commandments. This was the job of the law, to show humanity we are sinful and there isn't anything we can do about it. And so for 4,000 years, before, from the time of Adam to the time of Christ, God's people lived under the law. The do's and the don'ts, the do's and the don'ts, to really show us you can. No one can except for a divine intervention. And that divine intervention was through Jesus. So what Paul is saying in verse 14 is the law told us we were sinners, but now through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, grace was introduced. You are free from the law. Now you have the power to live according to the law. We get to live for Jesus. We don't have to. Living a righteous life is a blessing. I lived both. There's nothing like obeying God. I will never want to go back to some of the things I used to do, ever. Kill me first, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Kill me first. I've told God that. Because when you live righteous, you're in line with who we were created to be. And there's no, that is priceless. So Paul is saying the law was a tutor for us. It taught us how bad we were. We were hopeless because we couldn't do it. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And now through his death and resurrection, we have the grace to live according to the law. So now Paul drives us home again in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Again, explanation mark. Certainly not. How dare you even consider such a notion? That is totally against God's will. That is against who he created you to be. So if Christians who tell us that it's okay to sin now that we're saved, take them to Romans chapter 6. There's two certainly nots with explanation marks. But that tells you that Holy Spirit is driving something home here through the Apostle Paul. I mean, he is imploring these people. Verse 16, do, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slave to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death? of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin at one time, before you were saved, you were a slave of sin. Yet, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to what you were delivered. What is that telling us? At one time, you were not saved. You had a sinful nature. But now that you've come to Christ, you heard the gospel, the Holy Spirit pricked your heart, convicted you, you said yes to Jesus. He transformed you. Now you were delivered to this new doctrine of grace. And verse 18, and having been set free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. Now, don't be afraid of the word slave, all right? It's really mastery or dominion, okay? When we were unbelievers, we, we were under the dominion of sin, we didn't understand God. God, we didn't love God. We didn't know God. We, we might have known of a God. We might have prayed to God. But unless we really came to Christ, nothing happens unless you really come to Jesus and give your life to him. All right? 
And so what happens is here, um, we were under the dominion of uh, uh, sin at that point. But now that we've accepted Christ, we are now under a new umbrella called righteousness. We were transformed from the power of darkness into the power of light. So now we're not under the dominion of sin, although we might act it. Some Christians act like they're under the dominion of sin, but they're not. They're being deceived. But now you've transitioned into the umbrella of righteousness, so live accordingly. Live under that righteousness. If you're a king and, or you're a prince that is the son of a king, why would you go back and live as a slave person? Or why would you go back and live with the pigs? That's what happens when Christians live in sin. They're going back to the pigsty. They're going back to the pig pen. They're not living their true nature of righteousness and holiness and godliness that God brought to them. And Paul is saying in verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness before you were saved and of lawlessness before you were saved, but now that you're saved, present your members as slaves of righteousness, which then is the fruit to holiness. Once we realize this, and this is revealed to us, we will produce holiness. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were in free of regard to righteousness. In other words, there was no true righteousness when you were an unbeliever. You were not under that jurisdiction of righteousness at all. You were under the jurisdiction of sin. Verse 22, I'm sorry, verse 21 Paul is saying, but what fruit did you have then in those things of which you are now ashamed? Now that the light has been turned on, you look back at your past life. I just demonstrated that a little while ago. Who wants it? Who wants to go back to that place? For the end of those things is death. Spiritual death, yes, but most and, and, and natural death and spiritual death. Solical death. When we live in sin, our psyche as Christians are really affected, and it breaks down our psyche. And it become, we become desensitized after a while to the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's a scary place to be. Christians who are desensitized to the work of the Holy Spirit. The way to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit is keep short accounts with him. Live righteous and holy before him and obedient. And that might mean we have to shake the short end of the stick. That might mean we have to admit to people that we were wrong, we have to apologize. But it's a lot better than living in sin. Letting God be glorified through our heart and in our lives. Verse 22, and having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. So now what Paul is saying is you're under the jurisdiction of righteousness. You have moved into the righteousness. You have now come into the family of God and now you have that fruit of righteousness or holiness. That is your fruit. Holiness is a action verb. It's something we live out before God. Holiness, absent from sin, set apart, sanctification. That is the fruit. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I have one other thing I want to say before we close up is this. You might be sitting out there and you have a besetting sin which is a sin that just keeps you keep falling into over and over and over again whether it's alcohol whether it's drugs whether it's sexual promiscuity pornography homosexuality whatever it is gambling lying cheating anger and you keep giving in and keep giving in and keep giving in and keep giving in Sometimes as Christians, we have to go through a process. We have to seek other godly counsel or other godly programs that he provides to help us in those areas. And there's no shame in that, not whatsoever. I happen to be a person that believes in Christian counseling. I happen to believe in good godly 12-step programs. I have some familiarity with them. And if you look at the 12 steps, Every single one of them are biblically based. Now, they may not know it, but they are. 
And sometimes Christians have to get involved in these things to help them from alcohol or to help them from drugs and to help them from different besetting sins. And that's okay because your goal is you want to live for the Lord, right? You want to live for righteousness. And God uses other people to help us. I know this message sounds like there's either black or white. Spiritually speaking, we are either a sinner or a saint. When we come to Christ, we're not half in and half out. We're all in. But to practically work this out, to practically work the salvation out, it's not so black and white. And that's okay. God works with us over a long period of time. As long as we have a repentant heart and our goal is to live for the Lord and obey him and eventually have victory over these things, God will help us. And that's okay. That's kosher. Does everyone understand that? You understand where I'm coming from? I get the besetting sins. I get it. Many people do. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, put aside those things. There's an Achilles heel. Everyone has something. Everyone has something that could destroy them if they let it. But it's a process. And you know, these small groups that we were just talking about, those are good environments to help you live holy. Get people who you can trust, that you can be vulnerable with. Say, you know what? I'm struggling with fill in the blank. I'm struggling with alcohol. I'm struggling with pornography. I'm struggling with fill in the blank. Get someone you can trust. Granny, you can't tell everyone this. You can't trust everyone. But there's certainly people in your life you can trust, other believers who can pray with you. And sometimes you have to hire a Christian counselor. I'm hiring a, I hired a life coach recently. Just recently I've hired a life coach myself just to help me navigate some things in my life that kind of perplex me. And I felt led of the Lord to do that. This is a godly woman, spirit-filled. I've known her for years, and I meet with her and, you know, every other week, and it's just she gives me godly counsel, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that impartation. There's no shame for that because I know sometimes left to myself, I'm going to go off the rails. I could develop a bad attitude. I could not trust God, but this person helps me to stay on track. I want to say it one more time, and then, I'm going to, then we're done. Living the Christian walk is not always black and white, okay? I'm a black and white person, so I had to really come to grips with this. It's not. The only thing that's black and white is the moment we get saved, we are transitioned immediately from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Christ. Our spirit is immediately healed and born again. That is black and white. That happens instantaneously. But it's a journey to get these other two parts to line up with that spirit. And God knows that. He understands it. Where we're in danger is when we don't care. Yeah, I got this besetting sin. It's the way I am. What are you going to do? God made me this way. No, he didn't. God would never make you a sinner and then tell you to overcome sin. Never. I'm not going to, you know, I've, I've got grandkids, I've got kids. I'm not going to break one of my grandkids' legs and then make them run a relay race. First of all, I'm not going to break their legs. Sometimes it's tempting, but, you know, if they break their leg, I'm going to help them. Let's go to the doctor. Let's get healed. Let's get help so you can run that relay race. That's the way God deals with us. So if you're dealing with besetting sins and you feel like your life is far from Romans chapter 6, not as far as you think. That's what Satan makes you think. Chill out. Don't ever adapt the attitude. It's the way I am. I'm going to do it. I don't care because we do have to answer to God. Right? We have to have the fear of the Lord. But there is help out there. And I know Pastors Jim and Kelly, I know their hearts are to help people get victory, be the best version of the person you can be in Christ. And that's what this is all about. Amen? That's what I got for you today. Thank you. God bless. I did want to touch on something I think is very important for us to all be reminded of. Thank you, Jeff. And that is this, that before the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of us and forgives us, we are enemies of God. We may think, you know, 
God's our best friend. He's the man upstairs. He's good to us. But until we surrender our lives to him and receive that gift of forgiveness, the Bible says we're his enemy. In fact, it goes on to talk uh, in many different ways about the fact that we are under uh, the ruler of the prince of the power of the air, the evil one. He's our king, if you will, until Jesus, until we intentionally make Jesus our king. And here, you know, Satan himself is a created being. God is the creator of the universe. He created all things. And yet, until we choose to receive forgiveness, we are under the rulership of something that was created. And so today, I want to just give everyone an opportunity. If you're here today, you know, and you've never truly said, I want to make Jesus my king, my Lord, and my Savior. I, I no longer want to serve under the rulership. I no longer want to be in, uh, under uh, the slavery, if you will, of this created being, Satan, who is out to steal and kill and destroy my life. I want to give you that opportunity today. It, it's an important moment for some of you because, you know, we can go through the motions of Christianity. We can be in church. We can do church things. We can hang around with Christians. But if you've never truly invited Jesus Christ into your life, repented of your sins, and asked him to forgive you, you're separate from God. You can do all the right things. You could be a good person. You could be accepted um, within our society and be viewed as a good person. But the Bible says that apart from having our sin dealt with, we are separate from God. In fact, enemies of God. And so I want to invite all of us to stand today with that knowledge. Listen to me. This can be your moment to make a decision to say, I want, I want to receive what Jesus made available to me. We've been singing about him. We've been worshiping him. We've been exalting his, exalting his name for all the amazing things he's done. But we could still walk out of here an enemy of God. It's so crazy to think about that. We can walk out of here an enemy of God because we refuse to accept that Jesus, his death, his burial, and resurrection, and the fact that he's seated at the right hand of the Father was enough for us. And so I want to encourage you. I, I'm, I'm very serious about this this morning. I want to encourage you. Consider what's been said today. Jesus paid a heavy price. If he didn't have to come, he wouldn't have come. If there's another way to God, then Jesus died in vain. He wasted his life. It was a waste of his life because we're so brilliant that we can fabricate another way to God that circumvents surrendering to Jesus. It just doesn't work that way. And so in your own place, you can, if you need to talk to somebody, I want to invite the ministry team in your own place, maybe where you're seated or at home today. I want you to think about the fact that sin separates us from God. Jesus came to solve that problem by shedding his blood so that we can be forgiven. And like Jeff said, that we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What an amazing gift. What an amazing offer. It's a wonderful offer. And so I'm just going to pray a prayer. I want to leave you with that. If you'd like to join me, do that. If you need to think about it in your home or talk about it with someone here at the front, I want to encourage you to do that. No one's trying to manipulate. No one's trying to pressure you. We're not trying to make this emotional. But it's a very real decision each of us personally have to make and so it would be something like this Lord Jesus I, I recognize 
that I have sin in my life. And I believe that you came to earth to deal with my sin. And I believe that you took my sins upon you and the wrath of God that I deserve upon you so that I can take, I can receive your full and complete forgiveness. I invite you now to forgive me. I'm, I'm turning away from all the things of my past, all the sins, all the rebellion, all the horrible decisions I've made. I just give them to you. And I ask you to wash me white as snow by your precious blood. And I choose to live the rest of my days as your child, as your son, as your daughter. And I ask you now also to fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may be empowered to live a life that brings you glory. It's something like that. It's not the exact words, right? You could say it the way you say it, but it's important to understand we repent from our sins. We receive the forgiveness that was paid for by Jesus' blood. We ask him to come and live inside of us. We surrender our lives, and we begin to live for him. Amen? So I want to pray for you as we close. I just wanted to be very clear. We're talking about the blood of Jesus. We're talking about forgiveness today. It's important for us to walk in that, not just know about it, right? A lot of us know about Jesus' blood, but has it cleansed us personally? Amen? And so let me pray for you as we close. Father, today, God, we give you praise. I pray that many people, many, God, within the sound of my voice in this room or online, God, Father, would receive that amazing offer. We know, Lord, that no one can come to you unless your spirit draws them. So, Father, I pray by your spirit that you begin to draw people to you, Lord, draw people, cause them to see themselves in light of Jesus, the one who paid the price for them. And Lord, we give you praise right now, God. May our lives be so set apart for you that we would be living a holy, righteous life that brings you honor. Father, I pray for every person in this room, God, that you would bless them, God, and Father, let the light of Jesus shine through their lives, God. Let their eyes, Lord God, uh, be viewed by others as those who just, it, let it just be visible, the glory of God on people's lives because of what you've done inside of them. And we give you all the praise right now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy some fellowship in the atrium. Uh, otherwise, if you need ministry, there'll be he people here to minister to you. God bless you.